the Honorable uh, Chief Whip of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker, and may I say what a great privilege it is to be able to participate in this debate today. The Speaker's right. I did say Malibongwe when you came to the podium, because I recognize that this is probably our last dance together of the Fifth Parliament, so I had to acknowledge you. So it is a privilege to participate today in what will probably be the last budget debate before the Fifth Democratic Parliament draws to a close, and we start to prepare the legacy report for the transition into the Sixth. It's an opportunity for us to reflect, too, on where this parliament has done well and where it has not, and also what place our parliament holds in the minds and experience of the people of South Africa. In doing so, it would be wrong to ignore the fact that trust in parliament as an institution of democracy has plummeted from 65% in 2004 to 38% in 2015. These findings of the Human Sciences Research Council are contained in the high-level panel report tabled at the end of last year. Why is this significant? Well, because the high-level panel went on to say, and I quote, trust is an essential element of democratic legitimacy. Declining levels of trust in institutions impact negatively on nation building, unquote. So what are the reasons for this loss of trust in our democratic institutions? I would advance that one of the chief reasons has, there has been a loss of trust in our institutions of democracy is because many of our citizens do not see these institutions, including our parliament, as relevant to their daily lived experience, nor do they see them as offering a ladder of opportunity out of their present conditions. A former leader of the opposition wrote that in politics there are two essential choices in the political arena. You can choose to be a signpost or you can be a weather vane. A weather vane, he wrote, and I quote, will twist in the wind, trimming sails to the prevailing winds of political correctness. It is the easy path of least resistance, but it usually leads over time downhill, unquote. A signpost, on the other hand, does not bend to the vagaries of the moment, but stands for a greater cause, for an enduring set of principles and beliefs. And there's no shortage of institutions that have become weather vanes to the prevailing winds of our time. They twist and contort themselves, this way and that, spinning listlessly trying to find favour with the current faction in charge or point to the popular side of the latest cause du jour. We saw it with the Hawks, who in the foul winds of state capture blew, failed to act when they should have against the Guptas, and who only now, as the political winds have shifted and changed, have suddenly sprung to life. Too little, too late. We saw it with the NPA, who blew this way and that, protecting those in political office and their collected elite from prosecution. Now that the winds have shifted, they've started to act. Too little, too late. And we saw it with this parliament, which protected and defended the worst excesses of the last eight years of the Zuma administration. Some latter-day claimants of sainthood now decry the thievery, the corruption, the looting and the rot. Yet they were the very same ones that sat around the cabinet table, nodding, backslapping, drawing salaries and perks, all the while knowing exactly what was going on. Sadly, they still sit here today. What we needed in these difficult times and with these challenges were democratic institutions that stood solid, rooted in values and principles, secure in their mandate, and who acted without fear or favor, solid, resolute, standing up for the Constitution, the rule of law, and democracy. We needed more road signs and less weather vanes. And so the question we have to ask ourselves as members of parliament is what is the sort of parliament we want to create in South Africa? How do we turn this parliament into a road sign, standing firm as a beacon of democracy, rather than a weather vane that twists and turns, buffeted uncertainly by prevailing political winds? Never is it more important for a parliament to be a road sign, not a weather vane, than when it is confronted by an executive that subverts, breaks the law, and ducks accountability. And we witnessed what happened when this very house became a weather vane to the Zuma tsunami of his presidency. Instead of standing firm on the constitution, the rule and law of law and principle, we were blown horribly off course over in Kondlagate, Sassagate, Guptagate, and Zumagate. 
And we must never, ever have a parliament again where the velvet gloves are used to mollycoddle the executive and shield them from accountability. We'll talk about Ms. Mvenia when you've dealt with Mr. Supramama Pelo, who I believe is hanging on for dear life, Mr. Mguni. This house is not a lecture hall or a classroom. It is a robust arena of accountability. And let me be clear, no member of this house requires a permission slip from the president or his ministers to speak up, speak us out and hold them accountable. And surely we must make this house more relevant to the challenges facing, facing our nation and work Hashtag shut up. Well, I hear that. Well, let me just tell you, because I'm very glad this issue has been raised. I'm very glad this issue has been raised, because let me just tell you something. That this ANC has been trying to get me to shut up for 21 years. They've never succeeded, and they never will. And I'm not even scared of concomitant action that's threatened and the like. You will never shut me up. I will never stop speaking up. I will never stop standing up. And I will never stop standing up for what's right in South Africa. We have an unemployment rate of nearly 10 million South Africans. This is a national disaster that threatens the very fabric of our society. The latest Labour Force survey should have triggered an immediate debate in this House of what is to be done. And yet it does not. We have a complete breakdown of law and order in our country. Our citizens are murdered indiscriminately in their homes. Women and children are raped. Criminals have taken to brazenly... Um, I'll tell you where Mrs. Dalil is when you tell me where Mr. Jacob Zuma is. <laughs> this House should be debating a plan of action on how to restore law and order across the land, and yet it does not. We have a crisis of poverty in our land. I'll tell you where Marietta is when you tell me where Pelo Jordan is. We have a crisis of poverty in our land. Our children are literally starving to death. Families reduced to living off grass and sugar water. This should outrage us. And if we truly are a people-centered activist parliament, we should be developing a national plan to feed our starving children. And this house should be leading the charge. And yet it does not. Instead, we debate selectively conflicts and suffering in foreign lands, ignoring the daily conflict and suffering of our own citizens. Debates on high holidays, this day, that day, joint sittings commemorating this and that, all retreating further into the glories of the past, yet all the while our present and future lie in peril. It's little wonder we have this widening trust deficit. Where to is the future focus? A vision oriented on the, with an eye on the future to come. Our House should be initiating debates that point the nation towards the future. Because believe you me, if we're facing challenges now, innumerable challenges lie ahead of us. The legislation we pass, the debates we have, the policies we implement, the oversight we do, should be preparing our country and our people, not only for the domestic challenges we currently face, but the global challenges that will confront us as a nation going forward. We should be debating, and this parliament should be on the very cutting edge of that debate, on artificial intelligence advancements. The job market is going to change rapidly in the next 20 to 30 years. Jobs and work as we know it today will simply not exist. We need to prepare our country and our people for its impacts and position ourselves to be able to take advantage of the huge opportunities that come with it. Major advances in technologies, the Internet of Things, drones, biotechnology, it's all going to force us to compete to attract even more to attract investment. But we cannot compete if we're not having these debates to prepare us for the future. We cannot compete if we're still indulging in backward-looking analog debates on the past <clears throat> in a rapidly evolving future-focused digital era. And we have a golden opportunity to leap this technological divide. Our education system is broken, our skills and technological capacities are hamstrung and constrained. Policy failure and poor planning has left our citizens, particularly our youth, massively vulnerable. The 2016 Global Information Technology Report, released by the World Economic Forum, ranked South Africa last in maths and science for the third consecutive year. Our disjointed and outmoded education and skills development processes, research and development, all need to be massively overhauled anyway 
and we have the opportunity to do so in a way that gives South Africa the competitive edge in the new economy to come. We can build a skills and technological powerhouse that will allow the youth of our country to ride the wave of the disruption to come and cash in on being world leaders in key modern industries. But only if we start leading that debate as this house. If we do not, South Africa and our people will be left behind. One of the primary functions entrusted to this house is the passing of legislation. This is not an era where there's great much to boast about. The fifth parliament's track record on passing legislation has been abysmal. In the 2017 year, the House passed only 11 pieces of legislation. Taking into account the financial legislation we are bound by law to pass anyway makes the figure even more miserable. The truth is we've not sat enough and often enough to work on and pass legislation. This has led to a massive backlog of now 34 pieces of legislation in the NA and 15 in the NCOP. The high-level panel acknowledged the shortcoming and expressed its disappointment in the key failure to legislate effectively when it said that, quote, the time it takes between the first submission of legislation to Parliament and its passage is too long, unquote. We did not, however, require the panel to point this out. A perusal of the programming committee minutes, the joint programming committee minutes over the course of the last three and a half years shows how the opposition repeatedly sounded the warning about the legislative logjam and the need to intervene, prioritise and make provision. We made suggestions repeatedly on what would need to be done, yet these were ignored. We have become the legislature that does not legislate. But allied to this is the budget of Parliament begs a further question, and that relates to our actual capacity as legislators to legislate. Time and time again over every budget year, the members of this House have raised concerns about the imbalance of forces that exist between the executive and Parliament, where the executive has abundant resources, the whole departments, batteries of staff, of research, review, planning, legal advice and data analysis. Yet the parliamentary research capability is horribly underfunded, the staff massively overworked and underappreciated. If passing legislation, and good legislation at that, is one of our core functions, then why does the budget not reflect that? If we don't seriously and urgently address this huge imbalance of forces, the legislative arm is forever going to be at the mercy of the executive arm. The ancient Roman poet Juvenal, in his work Satires, famously asked, who will watch the watchers? In any system, those who exercise oversight over others should themselves be subject to oversight. The answer to the question that he poses in our parliamentary instance is the Ethics Committee of Parliament. And I'm sorry to say, Honourable Masondo, but your committee has been an absolute abject failure rendered completely moribund by committee leadership that do not understand how ethics work or how to effectively run processes. The committees met once this year, despite a massive caseload of complaints against members of this House, ranging from assault of women to dishonesty to theft of public money. And it's an indictment on the chairs of this committee that the important work of this committee, so deeply respected during the tenure of Mr Ben Turok as the chairperson, has been reduced to, yes, Mr. Masondo, a low-level political hit squad, where opposition members are in the crosshairs, but a lumbering and docile committee when governing party members are required to be investigated. And frankly, I would be ashamed. I would have sent a sick note in if I was you, rather than come and defend your miserable record in terms of this committee today. Point of order, Deputy Speaker. Yes, Honourable Member. Certainly, the Honourable Member is casting aspersions on the good integrity of uh, Honourable Masondo. And if, um, if he wants to do that, he must do so uh, through a substantive motion, then we can deal with it. Can you please ask him to withdraw that? No. Honourable Members, we will come back on that matter. I uh, will go and look at it and so that we refer I don't, to it I, properly. Yeah. Deputy Speaker, thank you. I don't require a substantive ruling. It was a ruling of the Court, of the High Court of South Africa which exposed this political hit squad for what it is and said, and I quote, that the committee was unable to follow even the most basic principles of a fair and just process. What an indictment. What an indictment on you, sir. Order once again, Honourable House uh, Deputy Speaker. 
Honorable Deputy Speaker, you have made a ruling that uh, you will come back to that. It means you will check answer and all. I think that it is absolutely uncalled for for the Honorable Member to continue on the same note because it is regards your ruling. Thank you. Okay. Uh, no, Honorable Member, I have, I'm listening and I will make a ruling at the appropriate time. This is the same committee who, when we lodged the first complaint against Honourable Manana, have still not dealt with it. He's on to a second transgression, and they still haven't dealt with the first one. Just shows you the states and how seriously they take action against ANC members, and how quickly they moved when it was the Honourable Mayamani. Mr Sheikh Imam, I see he's done a hit and run. He's not here. I just want to say that he's the ultimate in hypocrisy, because I want him to tell me which NFP members are living in the Keisha Park, Pelican Park, and the others because he decries the fact that members have that. He talks about the overseas trip, the very Im impressive and important work we did there, Madam Speaker, to Ghana and London, but fails to point out that his own chief whip of his own party attended the very same study tour. That is rank hypocrisy. And when you go out, Madam Speaker, to do the investigations into the constituency offices, please do take a little bit of time to speak to the staff members in that office. Because in Mr. Imam's office, a staff member had to get a restraining order against him because he kept threatening him and illegally docked his pay. The poor man had to go to various uh, courts of law to try and get Honourable justice. Honourable Deputy Speaker, point of order again. <laughs> yes, Honourable Member. Honourable Deputy Speaker, this yes. is definitely personal and it cannot be right. It's yes. casting aspersions. Yes. It can't be right. Honourable Member, that's sustained. That order is sustained. Go ahead, Honourable Member. Deputy Speaker, Deputy Speaker, may I address you? Yes. Which rule was Honourable Member referring to? Honourable Member, that the... It was personal. What rule is that? Casting... Please, please quote the rule. No, please quote the rule. Honor, honourable please Member... Please such rule. You can't make member, them up. Take your seat. Take your seat. Honourable Member, it's important that we desist from those personal... Uh, on members, as is required by the rules. Proceed to Honourable Member. Out of respect for you, Chairperson, I'll withdraw and I will certainly share with the press the copy of the, uh, of the affidavits and the, and the order of court. Because uh, it's very clear that the ANC are covering up for unfair labour practices. You know, they talk about the farms that have been going on there, they're covering up here for unfair labour practices. But I would then again take very, very careful note of taking advice from Mr Sheikh Imam. Political parties have one job, and that's to contest elections. And when you can't even register for the last election held in South Africa, I've got to ask yourself, how seriously can you take Mr. Sheikh Imam and his party? The Honourable Killian threw her own party on the, under the bus, and I agree with her list of indictments against the government, home affairs departments that are in absolute disarray, clinics that De aren't working, Deputy Speaker. hospitals, hospitals yes, that are Honourable falling Member, apart. What are you raising on? Just please your seat, Honourable Member. Yes. I, I'm, I'm asking whether Honourable Stevenson is, pe is prepared to take a question. Yes. Honourable Stevenson, are you prepared to take a question? I'll be consulting in Barney's after the sitting. Happy to take it there. Um, so the Honourable Killian there spoke about that, and she then accused the Honourable Waters of misleading this House. Well, it'd be very nice if she maybe attended from time to time the Parliamentary Oversight Authority, where in front of ANC members, that information was released to the committee in the budget hearings of the last quarter. So if you're accusing anybody of lying, please can you go and take it up with the Parliamentary Budget Office and the Parliamentary officials who give us the information in the committee, again, casting aspersions on your own operation. With friends like that, who needs enemies? I do just want to say that our Parliament has achieved much, but it's also fallen short of what our Constitution expects from us. I think we can do better as a Parliament, and I think that we can do better as parliamentarians. This House has to become a place that realises the very best dreams of the hopers and defeats the worst intentions of the haters. The House has to become a place where freedom is defended. The House has to become a place where opportunity is expanded. The House has to become a place where diversity is celebrated and the House has to become a place where fairness is legislated. And if this great Parliament can be that road sign, standing firm through even the darkest night and strongest storms, resolutely directing us to a new hope, then the answers to the questions that we ask will be answered. The power to solve the media challenges that lie in our hand are before us. We need to have the courage to grasp them. Your time is expired. The challenges Another lie ahead member. of us. 
and we must all grasp them together. Thank you. Honourable Vincent Smith.